started, everyone. So welcome to today's colloquium, which is a really special treat to have ZX Shen, our own ZX Shen, who is a preeminent condensed matter experimentalist, famous for his work on probing materials, the excitations of materials, in a way I think it's called ARPIS that he'll explain. Um, he is the Paul Pidgeot Professor of Physical Sciences and also spent a term as the Chief Scientist at SLAP, which is a cool title as well. Um, he did his undergrad at Fudan University and his PhD here at Stanford in Applied Physics. Um, he has numerous awards for his, for his efforts, uh, which would take all day to read, so I'll only pick a few. Most recently, he was named the Tanja Erlander Visiting Professor uh, at the Swedish Research Council and Royal Institute of Technology. He's a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and the National Academy of Sciences, the NAS. Um, he got the Oliver Buckley Prize from the APS, the E.O. Lawrence Award from the Department of Energy, the Honest Prize for Superconductivity. Um, and one of his amazing achievements is his mentoring of the next generation, along with all this amazing research. So that includes 100 students and postdocs, of which about half have gone on to faculty jobs, um, their own fruitful careers in the field. Um, and with all of this, CX is also a wonderful colleague, um, and I'm particularly interested to hear what he's going to describe. So thank Great. you. Thank you, Eva. Good afternoon. Um, Giorgio asked me to give a talk, and he said, make it more general. So what I'm going to do is spend the first uh, 15 minutes, talk a little bit about a broader things. Since I live in this building, the McCullough building, there's a history related to material physics to that building, and to inference this particular area we live, and to the rise of Silicon, uh, of Stanford to the eminence there. So uh, we all know that that's the start out with the gravel, and if you put an arc melt, and you start, you end up with this magic solid. Okay, for people live in this region, we all know how the magic sil solid of silicon has transformed this area, the way our living. I want to make a note so that's end of 1940s. Oh, Walter. Okay, uh, uh, that's the impact of the electronics. Another area which has happened more recently over the last decade is the rise of solar power. Also come out of the silicon and also happened at the Bell Laboratory. It's a similar type period of time. It's always good to take a look and ask the question, okay, how we got here? Okay, where we are going? So that's what I want to talk about today. So again, come back to the late 40s, and that this is what happened at Bell, okay? And you can see that it's a rare uh, in the important inventions, two of the three are theorists, that's uh, Shockley and Budding, okay? So uh, Shockley is doing experiment because he was the manager of the group. So that's how this goes in, the, in this picture. So that's a lot of the early days. So what I want to talk about is how this evolves. We all know you have a quantum theory of solid, and that's the Hamiltonian you was trying to solve. It's the stationary Schrodinger equation, okay? And it's difficult. So you make the most simplest it approximation you get, and many will say, try a unreasonable approximation. In essence, try to say that all the electrons behave as independent electrons. This is the important approximation, means that the behavior of the electrons is independent of other electrons. Take the extreme um, example, take this room, that theory will say anyone who comes in has the right, can sit in any seat. And we know that's not true. Some of the seats being occupied. 
problem is just like that. In other words, whether your behavior is totally independent of the others, and that's to the core of the many body physics we encounter and challenge. Okay, so, and with that, actually, there's many things, and this is a sort of a famous paper on the band structure of the silicon in this case. That formed the scientific foundation of the semiconductor industry. Okay. So connecting to Stanford, that's the McAuliffe building we're in now. Okay. Shockley, being a West Coast person, came back, and he was in the second floor of, uh, in the McAuliffe building. And uh, I'm going to come back to Shockley and the semiconductors. And you can see that's the Gordon Moore and the Moore's Law. And that's the Moore building with the donation to the university. Also, I think Shockley uh, uh, instigated or convinced Pearson, who's also a West Coast person, came back. And he had office in the third floor okay, in the Mokala building. And Pearson also convinced another person as a young assistant professor at uh, Swanson, and Dick Swanson came. And when I was a student, he left to found this company called Solar Sun Power. And so in this industry, there, is, there are two laws and some connection with this building. One is the Morse law, you heard a lot about it, depending on which year you count. If you come back in 1955, when the first semiconductor electronic device was, I think that's a region's one, okay? Then it's about, you know, depending on which year it comes, it's about eight to 12, uh, 11 orders of magnitude improved in density. This is Swanson scaling law, and you can see that the cost of solar cell go down tremendously, depending on the year, probably now by 99.97. That's why solar now can reach the grid parity and compete well with fossil cell uh, fuels. Okay. Now come back to uh, semiconductor. As you know, that Shockley, Stanford is very liberal, and uh, while he was still on the faculty, he, uh, he started this company, and he named it Shockley as Semiconductors. And that's actually, this building still there, not that, quite recently in San Antonio Road. Okay, here, okay. So he has about 18 people, and he has his brilliance, but he also is a very difficult person to work with. <laughs> okay, so um, finally, he assembled a very strong and very good team. Eight of his people left, and what Shockley would call as the traitors eight. <laughs> And that's uh, funded the semiconductor company called Fairchild Semiconductors. Okay, it takes a lot of courage. Mr. Shockley was a, a you know big shot. Okay, to go against Shockley, but they eventually convinced themselves, and that uh, in a restaurant, and they sit together, took a one dollar bill, and each signed their name, mm -hmm. and that's their declaration for independence. <laughs> With, okay, from Bill Shockley. So that's sort of the story. And a lot, I want to talk about three individuals among the eight. eight. And one is Bob Noyce, and he was the, he the leads the Fairchild Semiconductor. And he had the nickname is the mayor of Silicon Valley. At his day, he's the, probably the one most influenced people. Today, of course, we, we heard about Jobs and Musk. So at his date, and unfortunately he he died young. He was a very heavy smoker. Okay. Gordon Moore, of course, uh, that's the Moore's law was named after, and as the surviving co-founder of Intel, and he had a huge impact on semiconductors. And for this particular physics community, came back and made a donation, the the building, which is not far from here. And also, many of us, at least I count five of us, got the Moore Foundation uh, Investigator Award from Research Grant for Condensed Matter Physics. Personally, over my career, I got three grants from the Moore Foundation, two for more applied, 
one is for the uh, photon enhanced thermionic emission, the other will be used for developing microwave imaging for metrology. And during the last cycle, I also got, had the fortune to get the uh, investigator grant. And it's been tremendous help for our research. Okay. Now, this person, Eugene Kleiner, is also a very interesting person. Actually, he's extremely interesting. He always walks through other people. Okay. He's a very good observer, and he always walks through other people. He actually was the sort of instigator, uh, instigate the rebellion against Bill Shockley. Okay. In fact, uh, Norris wasn't ready to go against Shockley at the time because he just had a new family, had a new baby, and a Kleiner convinced him that's the thing to do. And Kleiner said he needs that brilliant and charismatic person from mid-America to lead the team. And that he was right. And the Fairchild, of course, is the legend of Silicon Valley. Kleiner, as a scientist, he also had an impact to the Fairchild Semiconductor. And later on, he started another tradition. How many of you actually heard about a venture capital firm called the Kleiner Perkins Clover and Bayer? Show a hand, please. A lot, right? Okay. So this is a firm across the street from Slack, and that's, he's uh, one of the, I think, he and Perkins were the co-founders of this firm. For those of you who have not heard about the firm, but you may, you probably have heard about the companies they founded, Applied Material, Genentech, okay, Amazon, Google, Twitter, Uber, you, uh, so those are amazing list of that. So also has, a connection. The most recent example has something to do with the Kleiner. As Stanford got a 1.1 billion dollars donation to start a new school, okay, and the, the donor was the uh, before he retired, he's the managing partner of this venture capital firm. Okay, Jiang Doi. So now that is so the, the simple implementation of semi, uh, of quantum and the impact has. Okay, on this region and world. Okay, so that's the story of you know how we got here and the question where we're going. Okay, the wake up call for those of us working in this field is the discovery of the Cupid superconductivity. Okay, and in this case we know the calculation we did done very well for the case of silicon fails. Okay. Uh, and this problem galvanized the research of condensed matter and the physics of many. Okay, if you will come back and ask the question, what went wrong? Okay, I came earlier, okay, one version of that is, this, again, this Hamiltonian is complicated. You make approximation to solve under certain limit, and one of them is, Maybe the independent electrons is indeed an unreasonable approximation. Okay. That's a particular vision. One year after the Cooper's discovery, Phil Anderson uh, suggested the high TC is the extension of the long-standing problem of insulating oxide, so-called the Ma insulated. He argued this Hamiltonian proposed by John Hubbard, the Hubbard model, Okay, has a emerging property of exchange interaction, maybe the mechanism. Okay, that was a proposal put on the table in 1987, and so the Hubble model now becomes the hydrogen atom of the strongly correlated electrons. Okay, and you can see this galvanized in this field. Many people talk about the cuprates and say it's a complicated problem and all that. But when you have a new discovery, you always map back to the cuprate phase diagram. In condensed matter, the latest trace will be the twisted graphings, and you see a mapping to the cuprate problems, and the cold atom, and all that, the other model. So, now, the question is that, really, can we really uh, develop a true many-body quantum theory? 
and in other words, uh, now it is very challenging, the Hubble model, okay, is still a highly debated subject despite decades of focused effort, okay? So the, the question will be how will we know whether we get it right, okay, in this way. So in that context, the precision measurement of electrons as a guide, okay, as, as an experimental guide will be very useful and that will be the story I'm gonna tell you, okay, about our research. And that's based on the photoelectric effect of, uh, of Einstein, and you have photon comes in and electrons coming out, and you measure the electrons. There are many modalities. As I had said, you have photon come out, you eject the electrons, and you measure the behavior of the electrons. It's a microscopic measurement. You measure ele behavior electrons. And in a simple way, you have an energy, uh, energy momentum uh, relationship because you can measure the energy on the electron, you get the dispersion relationship. The behavior of the dispersion relationship can tell you a lot about many body physics. For example, the electron electron scattering can broaden this, and which is proportional to the energy. Or if you couple to a boson such as a phonon, you will see a sudden break at the frequency of the phonons or in systems with strong spin orbit coupling, then you also will see a band spreading. Or if you have phase transition, then you have an electronic order, often means that that's a symmetry breaking and opened up an energy gap. And in this case, you can get measured order parameter, or you actually get information about wave function by analyzing the pol uh, polarization dependent measurements. So you can get riches of the behavior of the electron information. And, but it's also very important that you, it's not just experiment, it, as I'll try to emphasize. It's always important that your experiments are put in the context and the environment of the science, okay? So again, that's the instrumentation development. There's a lot of that. I'm not gonna go into it. The basic, the modern spectrometer is are uh, the two hemispheres, and you bang the electron in certain way, and you do uh, imaging. So there's a lot of improvement over the decades. Then you also, of course, you want to have the materials, the sample environments are also very important. And the data processing and the simulations are important. And of course, always the match of the experiment with theory that's critical to make progress this way. So it's really important to get yourself into this ecosystem of reinforcing each other. So um, as you can see that there's continuous improvement of the experiment and you can, you, yeah, if you look at the papers and you can see the publications and there's always a matching of the development of instrumentation and the problems such as the cuprate graphing, superconductors, topological material, and the TMDCs, and you can see continuous growing up. This probably, the, here, some of that probably is just the uh, accounting methodology problem. But it, it's clear that the cuprate is one of the inflection points of this view. Okay, so, let me acknowledge my collaborators. Um, this is a, a group funded the project and by the Department of Energy through Slack, and we're using the facilities both at Slack and also at Berkeley. And for what I'm, most of what I'm gonna talk about are come, uh, done by the Bing Line 5 at SSIL, really being built by Dong Hui Lu and Makoto Hashimoto. They have a line here. Even though it's a very old synchrotron, it remains one of the most competitive uh, facilities. And uh, now, uh, with photo mission, we also work closely with Zahi Hussein and Sang Kong Mo at Berkeley. And materials is provided by Hiroshi Aisaki and the MBE was built by Ra Moore. And the more recent advance is, uh, in spin and uh, time and spin resolved one by Patrick Kirchman and Jonathan Svoboda. And it's a tremendous joy to work with the group of Tom Devereaux and Brian Morris um, on the serious simulation. Uh, we talk about McCullough's building 
it's really a science and intellectually rich environment. Okay, I also benefit have samples from Aaron, Ian, and Harold. And the conversation with Bob and Steve and Xu Chang is always very stimulating and thought provoking on that. The great thing about it is that, as I was chatting with Eva, that there's a lot of difference of opinions in that, and those opinions always debate about it in the building, and that's tremendous. And uh, then I also benefit from other co collaborators, Deng Hai Li from Berkeley, Nagosa from Tokyo, and Yang Zanan from Leiden. Okay, so um, it's a tool. Uh, I'm going to talk about a tool, and it tool has a broad applications. So I'm going to give a sample of the, what the tools can do and the problems it deals with. One, of course, is the testing of ideas. One is the D-wave superconductivity. The other, the topological electronic structure. Okay. The other will be how to use the tool to benchmark theory. One of them is to test the Hubble model we talked about. Okay. Or you're hunting for fingerprints of the many-body interaction, as I said earlier. If there's an interaction of a collective mode, it should leave a fingerprint for you to search for. As a practice scientist, we also always know the most exciting thing is the discovery of surprises in science. And that's the one of the things. In this context, is really the pseudo gap in the cuprate problem is an unexpected uh, surprise in that. If I do have time, I'll say a few words about where we're going um, in the new development of spin and time domain. Okay. So, as I said, the first sort of major thing did with this technique, with the, it was the uh, testing idea of D-wave superconductivity. And at the time, we can take, we need three hours per each of the spectrum. But we show that at the diagonal, nothing really changes above and below TC, okay? But at the zone boundary, there's quite a change of the above and below TC. And we said this is consistent the observation of this node is consistent with D-wave superconductivity. Of course, today, you can measure the gap along the entire Fermi surface, and you can see, you can take the spectra, and if you fit the spectra, that's what you get, and the, the solid line is the D-wave uh, gap structure. Okay, it's, it's quite consistent. Well, a conventional superconductivity will be more or less like a constant in this way. Okay. So that's one sort of thing you're testing ideas. Another in a superconductor, you can testing idea is, it was found by a group in Chumba that if you grow one unit cell of this superconductor, a monolayer, on a substrate of strong cell titanate, you find that superconducting transition goes from 8 Kelvin to, 90, uh, to 60 Kelvin. So it's a dramatic difference. The question, they were suspecting that the interface did something. Okay, so that's the idea. They did try to do that. It turns out there are two things happen. One is the charge transfer, but indeed there's also an interface coupling. And in our case, in terms of fingerprint, will be you can see I see a band structure and I see a shadow of the band. That's the fingerprint you're saying. That's the shadows are coming from an interface phonon at this, at this energy of that. Okay. So that can be test of idea. We talk about the band structure, energy level, and energy spectrum, but it, I think uh, about a, a decade and a half ago, it's also realized that may, it's also important in the context of, sh uh, of the Schrodinger equation that actually there's important information encoded in the wave function, in particular, is the atomic part of the wave function, right? That's, uh, uh, this, by the way, is the, uh, is the Bloch theorem form uh, related with the Felix Bloch of this department. Uh, and then you, you can see that this, there's a, a clear prediction, okay? There's clear prediction to say that if this is the case, if there's a, uh, things like a spin orbit coupling and a band inversion, inevitably there's a certain topological protection in the, in the system. You should see a surface state in this way. 
and uh, indeed that's a collaboration with Yang and Xu Chang, and you can see really you see this beautiful Dirac state in the experiment of that. That again is sort of category you would call the test of ideas. Um, the more related subject in a more recent one, the iron selenium terulean was proposed as a very promising topological superconductor. Okay. But one of the questions was, where is the Dirac state? Okay. This turned out to be technically hard, but it, now you can see with a very careful experiment, you see the Dirac state uh, throughout the entire Brian zone of that. That's very consistent with the proposal that this system is a topological superconductor. Okay. In the same context, if you have a two-dimensional topological superconductor, then you have the quantum spin hole insulator state, and there's a prediction of the band structure. If that's the case, uh, spread by the spin orbit coupling, and indeed you can use this kind of spectroscopy to show that indeed you can identify a, a gap, and that's about among the topological materials, it's a pretty big gap. Okay, and it looks like uh, tungsten diterolite with a part of the transition metal dichalcotonite. As we all know, it's a very hot and interesting field. And with that, you can also actually see the edge states in this material system. Okay. Now, you can also use this spectroscopy to optimize the material. Tungsten diterolite is a subject being studied a lot. Okay. But if you really look at the system systematically, instead of tungsten diterolite, you can look at the tungsten diselenite and the moly diterolite okay, by replacing different materials. Then you, can, you realize that, ha, huh, tungsten diselenite is probably a better topological material. Okay, it's a much bigger gap. Okay, so that means that you can have things at a higher temperature. On the other hand, the Morley material, Morley tetralite, would, would not be the case. Okay, so now let me, uh, since we talk about TMDCs, another subject that uh, had a lot of interest from more of an engineering point of view, that if you take Morley disulfide in a different phase, if you make them in the bulk, it's an indirect band gap semiconductor, but if you make them again atomically thin, it became a direct band gap semiconductor. And indeed, you can use this technique to see that. You see, in the bulk, you see the image of valence band maximum and the conduction band minimum are different. Well, uh, in terms of where the intensity show up in the brain zone. But once you grow them into the monolayer, now you can see they are located in the same point of the brain zone. Okay, that's consistent for them to be now a direct banger semiconductor. Okay, now let me go with the second sort of category of things you can do with that, uh, namely the benchmark theory. Okay. One of the very interesting concepts in one dimension is so-called spin charge separation. Okay. Here's a cartoon. Okay. Assume I have a one-dimensional chain I have photon come in and take out a real electron. A real electron means I take out a charge and the spin of the electron. Now you can see that as this defect propagates this, now you can see that it can decay into two top of, uh, yeah, defects. One is a hole, okay? Both sides, the spin is still sort of correctly aligned or it's a spin misaligned situation. In other words, if you would have an energy momentum relationship, now it's changing from sort of single uh, uh, pole in this case to two edges in that case, okay? And that's sort of you can try to use the Hubble model to test that. And indeed, in the experiment now, you can see that you can see the dispersion of the spin down edges uh, and hole on edges. And in this case, you can actually, within this framework, you can, because you know the exchange interaction from a neutron scattering, and you know the uh, hopping from 
the bank structure, actually you get, get a pretty good quantitative test. Okay. This lays a foundation for a bigger question. Remember I mentioned about 87? Phil Anderson said the Hubble model is where the physics is, okay, but it's been debated for that long. So is, in other words, is the source of the attractive interaction, as an emerging interaction of the Hubble model, J, can that explain this? Okay. The, it turns out, okay, we know the model describes the insulating phase as I showed in the last experiment. The question is that is the model sufficient to describe interactions among the doped carriers? Right? Remember, we, we have the system which is an insulator, we dope the system, end up with a superconductor, okay? So, and, and this model is difficult to solve. However, in one dimension, okay, the theory is much better controlled, as indicated by the beta angels, okay? So at least in this case, there's a way you can direct test experiment and theory. In two dimensions, the problem is that when your experiment and theory does not agree, you don't know if the model is incorrect or the computation of the model is incorrect. Now, in one dimension, at least the mo we know if there's the model, that will be a reliable computation of results of the test. And, but this, it turns out, experimentally, it's been very hard, okay? So, and in other words, the single crystals which we need for our experiment uh, cannot be doped. And they eventually, we were able to dope them with the same films, okay? And this, for example, is a 14% doping by MBE, growth film. And you can see it's a, a twinned crystal, so you see two sets of domains, each are of one dimensional. And you can get a dispersion relationship. And if you, let, if you make a cut in the profile and make a comparison with the experiment, then you can see here the experimental results. In particular, I draw your attention to this shoulder. And this is a reflection of the interaction among two doped carriers in the system. And you can see that if that's a Hubble model, it also have a feature if you have a lover's eye, there's a tiny thing here, but it's clearly not as big as the experiment. Okay? So you can say, okay, well, if in that case, can we supplement it? Since we already have the Hubble model, you think that's the on-site cooling interaction being taken into account. Then you can see, what if I add one more term? And Tom's group uh, worked on this by simulating situations for the next neighbor. Okay, you can either have a positive, repulsive next neighbor doesn't seem to do much. But if you have an attractive next neighbor with a magnitude similar to that of the hopping, and you can see, sort of can explain the sperm. So to, to say that this model needs to be supplemented. What is also interesting, that you can take this, just with this one term and one parameter, you can explain the entire doping dependence. Notice that this feature which I focus on by the time you reach 28% doping, it's barely visible, okay? So you can see that type of testing you can have between experiment and theory. Okay, now let me talk about the most, uh, uh, where we have spent most of the time, and it's the surprising discoveries that being a focus for a long time, that's a really, the phenomenology of the sort of the, the pseudo gap basically surprises on that. A Fermi surface, right, is a concept of a volume in, in the Brillouin zone. The volume of the Brillouin zone uh, of the Fermi surface should reflect how many fermions you have. Okay. Therefore, the Fermi surface should not stop in the middle of nowhere. Okay. So the the basic phenomenology is that they should either closed or ended up in the boundary of the Brillouin zone. So there's a concept of volume rather than a line. Okay. 
The basic phenomenology to say that this is a phenomenon sort of stopped in the middle of nowhere, and that is a debate. Uh, that's the general phenomenon in different families of cuprates. You can see the Fermi surface stop in the middle of nowhere, okay? And the interpretation of that varies a lot, including this other side, okay? Including uh, this other side, you just don't see it with a lower spectral weight, or it also extend all the way with also spectral weight. So this has been a debate in the field. It's a central, one well, the central debate because it's very different for, with what we know about physics of metals. And that's what we've been working on over the last, um, um, I would say, two decades, okay, with, and the most recent one is uh, interesting to say, uh, to say that we find a almost vertical boundary in this phase diagram with a critical, and the critical doping of that. This, I would say, is quite different from, uh, distinct from an electronic uh, only model. Okay. Then you can also ask yourself, what are the ingredients? Over the years, we also look for the ingredients as that includes hunting for what I said, if you would couple two phonons in this case, and you should see you should see a break in the electronic dispersion at the frequency of respected phonons. So there's another ingredient in the problem. That's when uh, Alessandro Lanzala was a postdoc here, and also during two, Tanya's uh, thesis work. Okay. So um, this uh, now I want to. Uh, it's always exciting to give a talk on some of the most recent progress that you made. So I'm going to talk about one thing related to this, and that's, uh, that's a work by uh, Ben, Xu, and others, okay? I come back to this Hubble model, okay? In this case, there's an exchange of the Hubble model, and which is anti-ferromagnetic, okay? And the question is, of course, there's a spin fluctuation, okay? The spin fluctuation clearly can lead to D-wave superconductivity. So that there's clearly a merit to it, okay? However, there's a dilemma. The, unlike a phonon problem, you have a, electrons and the phonon are different things. The electrons get a retarded, attractive interaction from the phonons, and you don't need to worry about the phonon. In a one-band electrons, then those electrons have to play two roles, to pair and to be paired. In other words, they have to be the athletes and the referees at the same time. This is a very challenging theoretical problem, okay? So the warning was given fairly early on by Bob Schrieffer. He basically said, you, if you do the sort of spin fluctuation theory, you need to take that into account, okay? This effect of impact on the electron itself. And he uh, pushed uh, in one particular limit at the long wavelength limit, and he will show this exactly canceled out, okay? And that's the vertex curve. And this problem is very difficult to get it directly on the in the experiment to test that. So recently, I think Ben, uh, on so-called electron-doped cuprates allow us to make a testing on that. This is a good system. Uh, much of the effort is on so-called hole-doped system. TC is higher, the, sort of this kind of rich, dense, uh, rich phase diagram. On the electron-doped system is interesting for this particular test because the antiferromagnetism is most robust. Okay, in, for this testing of that. So that's what we will uh, set out, try to do. And this, again, okay, you have a metal Fermi surface, okay? And the dash line is the anti-ferromagnetic zone boundary, okay? If you have a symmetry breaking, you have a bank folding, then you open up a gap at the boundary. And what in the field you call it the hot spot. Okay, now let me show that if I would take a spectra across this 
at a larger scale, this is sort of a great scale. You can see that as I go from the node towards the other side, going through the hot spot, you see a lot of region of spectral wave uh, suppression. Um, and now let's, with that, you can see I'm going to show you the, a movie of cutting around here, and you can see here. Okay. This, uh, by the way, is the work we sort of collaborated when I was in Sweden for, uh, on sabbatical with the, uh, with the hosting group. And you can see that, okay, you can see in this region, that's the way. Okay, let me show one more. Okay. Start out with a lot of weight, then you can see the weight get less in the middle, and then recover again in this one. Okay, now if you take it more quantitatively, you can see here the temperature dependence. Okay, this is a material with the relatively low TC in Cupre standard, uh, 25 Kelvin, but that's the best in electron doped system. And if I take this, and you can see that above TC, there's a very large energy scale, the spectral wave is really suppressed, okay, uh, in, in this way, okay. Then below TC, you also see at a much lower energy scale, one order magnitude lower, and you see a superconducting peak. If you look at the temperature dependence of this peak, you can see it coincides with TC, that's the magnetization of that, okay. So, uh, there are two things. One is superconductivity, the other is a broader, much larger range of spectral wave suppression. And just as the note, you also the system, this, uh, uh, you see a very weak, very faint, specific heat jump. Okay, this is probably the reason why really no one published the specific heat in, the, in this system. It's hard, uh, okay, uh, which is a related subject. Now, if I would again go around here, you can see that the superconducting gap gets bigger and bigger, then gets smaller, the non-monotonically change. If I get now, with that, I come back to this, and I hope you now see this shade shadow is really the superconductivity. and shows a maximum, okay, at this region. Okay, it, near the hot spot region means that it's the most deviated from the Fermi level zero. In the same time, you see the spectral weight in this region also suppress the most. Okay. So sort of, in a sense that whatever the interaction is here, give you a maximum of superconductivity in this region. At the same time, also take out the density of states you needed to promote the superconductivity in this way. Now, if you will analyze more quantitatively, you can see that that's the size of the superconducting gap at its maximum, and here is the density of state you can see corresponding to a minimum. Also, when you're at the hot spot, you see a coherent peak of the superconductivity, but if you're far away, it's hard to see the coherent peak. Okay. So this behavior, in other words, the good things come with a compromise is exactly what Schrieffer has talked about. It's a, a, a spin fluctuation period is a constrained problem in this. Okay. Now, um, let me, I, in the remaining time, let me say a few words about where we are going in the future in terms of how to further develop this photometric tool and apply to the science problem. Okay, one of that is uh, the spin result. This is the regular photomation of the bearing structure you measure. Okay, and now you can make spin result measurement. Okay, and you can get a lot of spin information. Now you can, for the aficionados, this is a extremely efficient spin uh, detection scheme. It's a difficult to detect electron spin because they don't couple very well to things, right? So uh, the, usually it's a extremely low efficiency and we have cited about the development uh, led by Jonathan in this and you can begin to look at the problem. Lastly is develop photomation into the time domain. This is really led by Patrick 
and you can see it's a time, in other words, you can have energy momentum if a dispersion relationship and take a movie out of that. And that can allow you to do certain things. And I'm gonna show one example how you would apply this. And in this case, we do the ultra-fast experiment, two experiments. One is the ultra-fast X-ray deflection using the free electron laser to understand the structural information. The other is do photomission to understand electrons behavior. And when combine that, it allow you to make a precision not possible otherwise. Now, the problem we are looking at is the iron selenium. It's an interesting superconductor of A Kelvin. It's a bulk, okay? Now, if you put a pressure in modern standard, it's fairly modest, okay? A Kelvin, um, A pas gigapascal, the TC go from A to close to 40. Okay, it's a very interesting change, okay? So what happens? It turns out that that is the pressure dependence. It turns out what is important is the height of the selenium atom in the structure. There are two sets of data. One is the pressure dependence, just showed here. The other is if you compile with different compounds, also show a strong dependence of this height. Okay. Then the question, it's a very question would be, well, what happens when you move this atom up and down to this height, and what's the behavior of the electrons? Okay, so this really raises a, a more general question, how to quantify the electron phonon interaction in the presence of strong correlation. Okay. You can measure electron phonon interaction by methods such as optics or Raman and various techniques. But in all this, you need some input, assumption. Okay. Either density of states or bare dispersion, and if someone say, I disagree with your input, then it's, you cannot have a conversation in this case. So the question, can you make a direct measurement? And it turns out that with the ultra-fast technique, you could. And you can use the time-resolved photomation to measure the energy level, and use time-resolved photomation to basically to measure the lattice, and if you have both of them as a direct measurement, okay, that is constant change or the energy level change, then you can make a test without having to have an input. Okay? And you can do the deformation potential. So that's what we set out to do. Like all experiments, okay, once you know what to do, everything in the end boils down to signal to noise. That's, that's like all experiment. So in this case, as a physicist, we all know the best thing is the locking. Okay, the technique locking being used all the time, but the locking in a conventional way, you lock in the gigahertz. That means you can make a macroscopic measurement with the locking technique. This experiment pushed that locking technique into the terahertz. That's why we call it the terahertz locking. We lock into the intrinsic phonons of the system. Okay, you can generate the incoherent excitation or coherent excitation. And in this case, you have IR pump and actually diffraction to figure out if you were able to generate a coherent excitation, then you get a lattice constant. Then you can also use V to probe and you get the energy level. And then you could get that. And that's the experiment and we we did the diffraction experiment use coherent light source uh, uh, LCLS as slack, and you can see here the pump and the probe, and we were very, very lucky, okay, in the sense of there's a one dominating mode you can promote in that. It turns out this was done by Raman, is the mode corresponding to that interesting selenium atoms moving up and down. Okay, it's sort of in this case, they can be coherently excited, and you can see the oscillation. But you can also measure the band structure. I hope you can see. You see the oscillation of the photomission band structure, the energy momentum relationship? Okay, and it turned out with the, exactly the same frequency. Each of them is 5.33 terahertz. Okay, 
And so now you can see the up is the X-ray diffraction data, and bottom is the photo emission data. And uh, uh, you notice that from here to here is less than one picometer, and you can see the signal to noise of that. Okay. In in this sense, it's a highly constrained experiment because the typical material with a lattice constant of a few angstrom. Okay. You don't want to change the lattice constant by more than a percent of the, the intrinsic material because you may well study something else if you deform it too much. Okay, so it's intrinsically a very small amount of change. But you can clearly see that. And of course you need to do all the fluence dependence, make sure you're in a linear response regime and all that thing. So I'm not gonna go into the detail, but good thing about it is that it turns out there's two computational results and an experiment, even better, the theory done by the Rutgers group before the experiment, so we at least have things put on the record on that this, this important physical quantity, deformation potential. They differ by order of magnitude. And they will try to resolve them, but the error bar in previous experiment was bigger than the difference of the, of the dis, uh, prediction. But now you can see that you can have the experiment which is much closer to the so-called dynamic mean field theory. In this particular case, the Hubble U was included in the calculation, which I again come back to when we, um, it's not a simple Hubble model, but it's it, the spirit of the coolant interaction was included in this calculation. So I hope to give you a sense of this tool we, we're uh, developing and that basically how this can be used. This is e a even earlier paper by Phil uh, on the importance of, of the emerging properties in quantum material and the really a fascinating, the principles are profound and hopefully some of them may even be useful. <laughs> okay, so with that, I hope to give you end with that how this several decades of how this technique um, keep improving and try to have an impact to the research of quantum material. Thank you very much. <laughs>
in one of the system where the spectra is clean enough, you know there's a quasi particle and there's a background on it. Okay, we would like that's in the manganese oxide compound. We would like to study the evolution of that, but it's um, it's not clean enough to, in some of those experiments for this particular question. Okay, okay. and a related question: how, Why is there a Fermi surface at all if it's strongly interacting? How do we know there should be that it should be sharp? Well, I mean, Bob in his paper articulated very clearly. We see quantum oscillations in the system. And that's extremely useful uh, of that. Maybe for the, for the broader audience, you know, whether there's a quasi-particle or not, it's a really an important concept for the physics of metals. Remember, in the early days of statistical mechanics, okay, we always say electronic specific heat is proportional to temperature, like, okay, in this way. And we also talk about the statistics of quantum mechanics by thinking of the electrons as independent particles in a box. Okay? And that's, that's sort of difficult to imagine those electron coolant intact. It, okay? it turns out, as Langdon pointed out, that at the low energy, all this type of thing doesn't matter. You have, still have a quarter part. Now you can see in the spectra, very complex spectra but you still have a, a zero energy pole in this. So I would say they exist in our spectra in quantum oscillation experiments. Otherwise, you are not going to see the quantum oscillation. Even, even though you're going well beyond Lando Fermi liquid theory, right? But anyway, Absolutely, okay, yes. Okay. Can I answer that? The experiment shows that you're not. That's what the existence, the experimental observation of the Fermi surface says. It says the Fermi liquid principle is holding Oh, and the suggestions that it isn't holding are disproved by these experiments. Mm -hmm. All right, your talk, Bob, <laughs> since you can, you answer the question for me, so I don't even need to do it. <laughs> Great, well, Steve. Sorry. Why is that not a contradiction of the theory? If you're interested offline, the answer is that's a critical. Uh -huh. Okay, sorry. Steve, yeah. Okay. At one point, you mentioned topological superconductivity. Yeah. Is that true in one dimension? That, that, that cannot be in one dimension. No, it's, it's, it's not. It's a multi-dimensional. I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah. Because I was trying to give samples of different experiments. I may not have been made very clear. It's not one dimension. That you're right. Yeah. The uh, optics types, one, we excite things either one, certain symmetries prefer one photon. Excuse my voice. Yeah. The, um, but other symmetry would be better done by applying, for example, two lasers that differ in frequency by we call this coherent Raman spectrum. Do you, uh, do you also do that? Yeah, the answer is what we do in terms of laser is extremely primitive <laughs> with your standard. But we, we, uh, that will be the things we will hope to do, be able to do more surgical. I stress in this particular experiment, we were very, very lucky. You know, we have, we zap it with the laser we have. May not be the laser we desire, but the laser we have. And we were very fortunate that one coherent phonon, and it was the most relevant one, it became the coherent excitation we, we have. So that's the answer. But going forward, clearly you want to have strategically excited them. But that's a totally different level of sophistication of laser. Yeah. <clears throat> Come on, graduate students. It's a um, very interesting question in the, in the following sense. You know, that subject also have debated a lot. Some of, some of the papers being withdrawn, but some surviving. 
and uh, I would say that it looks like the 260 Kelvin su superconductor is the one who seemed to survive, certainly 200 something. Uh, as a matter of principle, they're significant, okay, because you could have a temperature, uh, superconductivity at that kind of temperature. I also think it's a significant, the whole line of research was actually initiated with some theoretical predictions. In other words, taking the theory and push it to a very high uh, limit, and people, you know, they, I'm sure that in the early days, when say 200 some Kelvin superconductor predicted, it sort of, you, you, you view it with a lot of skepticism, but it, it, the matter is, is there. So now, I, to me, the Cupri problem, I mean, Bob will say that. Before that, I, uh, uh, the field of superconductivity, certainly there's no, nothing written down, but the folklore says 25, 30 Kelvin was the highest one. And, you know, Ted Jibor holds a record for that long, right? And that is still, you know, it's a sort of folklore and confirmed by so many decades of, of effort, a failed effort to raise TC of that. So all those progress is tremendous. And for me, the, the, the cuprate problem is the liberating of, liberation of minds. Because what we saw was impossible became possible. And from that point of view, it, it, we can say that we saw we had a limit. We certainly don't. And that limit is getting closer, higher and higher. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Yeah. Thank you.